Hi, everyone. It's another episode of All Access with me. And uh, today turns out to be the 33rd episode of All Access. I can't believe I've been doing this as long as I have. Um, I sometimes can't believe that I've been in this space as long as I have. Uh, for those of you who don't know my background, I was doing cryptocurrencies back in 2002. So that's uh, quite a bit before Satoshi. And uh, so I've been around for a long time. Uh, but the podcast, this is format, is not something that I thought I would enjoy, but I, it turns out I, I really immensely enjoy it. Um, I have been thinking about how to mix things up a little bit, how to uh, provide for more interaction, you know, something more exciting than, than me ranting. I can rant for hours. Any good technologist should be able to rant for hours on technological issues. I can also rant about social issues too, but you know, it's, uh, that's a fine line between BS and uh, an opinion. But, uh, but the tech stuff, I can rant for hours. And uh, uh, so anyway, so I, I kind of want to direct it with your input. And so I'll experiment today with taking some questions uh, from you guys. So if you are watching this on YouTube and you, uh, you comment, those comments are going to appear on my feed. And uh, towards the end, I'll, I'll look through the feed and see what kind of questions are coming up. So let's go through the various different things that I wanted to cover today. Um, the very first one is an exciting one. So ever since we launched Avalanche, I've been getting a whole bunch of questions from the most, most surprising set of people. Um, I, of course, expected to get a bunch of questions from people who are deep techies, people who want, you know, people who are uh, aspiring um, aspiring people in management at various different companies. Of course, we expected that that did happen. That does continue to happen at an ever increasing pace. Of course, the gaming companies, of course, all of the, the, the traditional finance companies, that's the usual suspects. What I didn't expect were the creative types. People who come to me, um, quite a few of them who came to me and said, hey, I want to do a movie or I want to do a Netflix series. And I, I want to do it with the help of some tokenization on the blockchain. This blew my mind. It's something that I wasn't expecting. It's something that is underserved at the moment. And it's something that we're doing something about. And so let me tell you a little bit about what these FFOs are. So film finance offerings. These are kind of like ICOs, except they're for the purpose of financing a film. Now you might say, why would that, why would you need that? Right? Why, why, what's going on here? that causes people to turn to blockchain and crowdfunding to uh, to finance their production uh, you know isn't aren't there enough well established channels what do you do you go to you go to hollywood you go to the studios and you get them to underwrite your stuff or you go to i don't know what kind of use in uh, france or you go to the european whatever one of the european agencies and uh, and you film something about like a coming of age movie that's the european thing to do right so uh, whatever it is that you want to do, there are there you would think there are channels. Well, there used to be channels, but but the scene has been changing quite a bit. And I've been thinking about this, this as an external outsider's view of uh, what's happening in the film world. And there are a couple of things that I, I think we can all observe. Number one is that the cost to make a professional movie or series has dropped immensely. So you and I. If we have a great story to tell, if we have a good, compelling, uh, you know, production, uh, we can actually afford to make it into a movie. It's actually doable. In the old days, it wasn't. You needed a film crew. You needed high-end cameras. You needed you needed actual film. You needed to develop the film. You needed to edit the stuff. It was expensive. Forget CGI. CGI was immensely expensive. R remember the. Uh, the times when uh, when you had to uh, to rent uh, these render farms from specialized uh, specialized companies, it was uh, it was. I mean, that's still true. You still have to do it, but but it was expensive as as heck uh, two decades ago. Now those costs have dropped immensely. CGI has become affordable. You could green screen a whole bunch of things, and you could film a, a, a an immensely immersive, uh, actually compelling story and make people lose themselves in it and have it look incredibly professional right now without that much money. The human costs are always gonna be high. You still have to pay, you know, if you wanna have Johnny Depp in it, you're gonna to have to pay him a lot. You wanna have Amber Heard in it, that's, that's your, your issue, your problem now. But, um, but the tech has become cheap and accessible. So the costs have come down. 
And that's an insane enabler. There is no way I can sort of, um, you know, I, I can convey like what this means to people other than to say, look, the, 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 the means of making movies was limited to mostly Americans. They, they had the capital. That's why Hollywood is Hollywood. And, and now suddenly uh, you can have really creative people in Turkey, in Poland, in Greece, in, uh, in Nigeria, you name it. They could be anywhere on the globe. They need not have access to a, to a fully capitalized financing infrastructure. And the, yet they can still tell a compelling story. And the thing is, people are sick and tired of the old dreck that's coming from, you know, from, from the usual suspects. How many, how many stories can you watch from Hollywood where you know, people do something bad and then bad things happen to them? It's a morality tale. And the good people win in the, at the end. The, uh, the bank robbers, if, if, I don't know if you've paid attention to this. In Hollywood movies, the bank robbers always get caught. There is hardly a movie I can, I can name where the bank robber gets away with it. It's not true in European movies. Jean-Paul Belmondo, you know, as you know, almost always gets away with his bank heist. Um, Europeans, of course, stop doing those. They start doing these coming-of-age movies. And after you've seen, you know, 20 or 30 of these, you kind of get sick and tired of them as well. So it's high time to actually branch out. There is good, exciting stuff coming from different directions. And, uh, and so it's, it's those people that need access to finance. And it's, uh, it's them who were actually started coming to me um, and, and started looking for ways of, uh, ways of, um, of, uh, of financing their, their next production. And the fact that they can do this is an amazing thing. So it's a great time to be a clever, creative storyteller. It's a great time to be in this business. I don't have an, have an ounce of this in me myself, but I do know people who are great at this. And uh, it takes a special skill and someone who can tell a compelling story visually is, uh, is a sight to behold. And now they can be anywhere on earth. And if only they can have enough access to enough capital to pay off the, uh, the human costs of their production, they can produce something that we haven't seen before, something that's novel, something that's authentic. And that, as you all know, is the most important thing uh, these days. It's just uh, that that's really the hardest, hardest thing to find. So there's an enabler here, a technological enabler. And, uh, and the remaining bit is this financing. Now, there's another thing that's happening, and that's the reach. Suppose these people can make their movie for cheap, um, or relatively cheap, at a, at a level of of expense that's uh, yeah, commensurate with what you can raise with crowdfunding. Uh, suppose that could happen. You still, for them to recoup their costs, you need you need a distribution channel. You need you need a way for their movies or series to reach large audiences, and that is also here. The internet brought us this. We knew it would, uh, but now it's here. So you've got your Netflixes, you've got your HBOs, you've got your Amazon Videos, and you've got all these other other content distributors who are in the business of, uh, of buying content from creatives and pushing it out. So if you're a good storyteller and you could raise, if you could raise the few million dollars it takes to make a fantastic movie, then you can make something that's much better than, I don't know what, the, you know, the, the most professional movies, the most expensive movies you could name. I think the most expensive one I could name is Titanic. It's a silly story. You know, you and I could film something where there is more room on that damn door. There's enough room for Jack and the girl. Um, and, and then suddenly it's a different story. Now we gotta have, we're gonna have to focus on, on their relationship and what it's based on. And then it's very different, far more complex, far more interesting, I might add, than, uh, than, what we, than the direct that we watched back way back when. So uh, this is all fantastic. The one remaining thing then, you've got the creatives, you've got the tech costs going down, you've got the distribution channels so you can monetize and you can make back your money once you, you raise it. So the one remaining snag is the financing of these efforts. And that's where the FFOs come in. That's what enables the creatives to uh, finance their effort through crowdfunding. Now, there's going to be a lot of regulatory questions as, as, as usual whenever there's money involved and, and fundraising involved. But in the U.S., this is very well regulated and the regulation is very, very permissive when it comes to crowdfunding efforts. There's a whole bunch of, I mean, you have to just go through the crowdfunding exception. Um, with the advent of the Internet, the securities laws were, uh, were modified to allow people to do crowdfunding for their efforts. And uh, it's very well established what you have to do. 
And um, you do have to do a filing, you do have to do a whole bunch of, you have to not do certain things, and then you have to uh, do the reporting that's required. So it's very well established, completely legal and completely above board way of raising money for a creative. So I'm really excited. And, uh, and uh, you know, and then let me get this other rant out. You know, if you leave Hollywood alone, what does it do? It gives you Marvel movies. Yeah, I love Marvel movies like as much as anybody else, but you know, it's just how uh, many comic book characters can I watch? How many shallow characters can I watch, say, snappy things on TV? You know, I can pretend to be a 15-year-old boy any day. I do every day. But uh, but after a while, you, I kind of want to watch a movie with a, with something more exciting, with, with, a, with a wider range of human emotions and so forth. So I cannot wait. I absolutely cannot wait to see the kinds of movies that are going to be produced through FFOs. And... Uh, so, uh, so I'm really excited, and FFOs will unleash a lot of creativity. And uh, one of the first ones uh, is is going to be this thing called Searching for Satoshi, I think, or In Search of Satoshi. It's a crypto-oriented documentary. Um, my film friends are telling me that there is an explosion in documentaries. There is a lot of people who are capable of of doing, who are really interested in doing uh, docu series, documentaries, the nonfiction. Um, counterpart of movies. So um, so there's apparently a, a, a boom in docu-series and documentaries, and I'd love to see these. This is like may perhaps a reaction to to the reality TV crap that we've been getting is is a is a is a shift towards the real. And um, so um, FFOs are here. If you know creative people in your circles who are looking for ways to raise money to tell a story, then FFOs are the way to go. And um, if they're interested, they can always get in touch with me. I'll direct them towards other friends who do this. I'm not in the business of funding these things myself. Um, I'm, I'm simply somebody who's observing the trends, but I am thrilled to see that FFOs are creating a new kind of a digital asset that allows people to finance these endeavors. And these endeavors in turn will bring something exciting and interesting to society. So this is a very, very interesting trend. I thought I'd uh, raise that to your attention. And, uh, and I cannot wait to see uh, search In Search of Satoshi, cannot wait to see all the other work that's going to be produced through FFOs. Let's see, what else has happened? Last month was a huge month for Avalanche. Lots and lots of exciting things happened. We broke a lot of all time high records. Monthly transactions, 34 million in August. Monthly gas usage, was 8.1 million in August. The previous high was, was 3 million. So the chains, not just one, it was we started out with just three, as you might remember. And with the subnet, uh, subnet architecture, we have many more now. I don't even know the count. Uh, but the chains in aggregate are clearing 8.1 million transactions uh, or gas, 8.1 million in gas in August, um, you know, much higher than uh, the previous high. This thing is getting use. This thing is working. This thing scales. One could wait for the merge, the verge, the surge, the purge, the whatever else. One could wait for, um, you know, whatever else, the, the peer review of stuff to come. One could wait for, uh, you know, the software bug updates and reliability improvements to a certain chain that seems to be stopped more often than, uh, than, than it actually clears transactions. Or one could just go to a, an, a, an ecosystem where things just work. They work because they were designed with science in mind. They were scientifically grounded. Um, and, uh, and I do know just how much crap I got all throughout the way, like all along the way, at every step, somebody, some know-it-all on Twitter was lecturing to me about how to build distributed systems. And here we are. Uh, the architecture scales. It scales because it's meant to. Uh, the architecture will scale without uh, without a bound, and um, and, uh, and it's really fun to watch. Uh, daily gas usage, new highs almost every day. Yeah, every day I wake up, there is more gas used. Uh, every day this month has been higher than the two previous spikes, and um, this is great. And uh, I do expect this to fluctuate. You know, so uh, uh, depending on what people are doing, depending on ARB opportunities, depending on price action in the markets, when there's a lot of volatility in the market, the prices are going up and down. The ARB activity, the pro profitability of, of arbitration, uh, arbitrage rather, of arbitrage 
um, goes up, and so then you get more more um, you know, more people submitting transactions. When uh, when things are stable, you get less uh, less volatility. So this will this will fluctuate. But when things are like this, I think this is a time to to sort of do the uh, not so humble brag. Uh, this thing works. You know, it's uh, kind of unlike every other one. And um, I am not. I was never in the business of selling hopes and dreams, and I was always in the business of delivering to you, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, in my section of this very large ecosystem, things that worked. And uh, and I'm so thrilled about it. So I'm thrilled to see it work. I'm thrilled that we are where we are. And uh, power to all of our competitors as they go through the, the, the myriad changes that they need to go through to catch up to where we were years ago. So uh, let's see. So this is Patrick Sutton summarizing the all-time high, 32 million transactions. Uh, in August, we have seven more days, so things can change. We can, we can go even higher. Um, August 2020 was was final testnet. We were in testnet. Like two years ago, there was no mainnet. Uh, August 2021, a, a year ago, we, we uh, launched Avalanche Rush, and that brought DeFi um, to Avalanche. And once DeFi came, of course, the innovation is here. So if I look at the thing that I care about, by the way, I don't care about these all-time highs and so on. The thing I care about is a qualitative metric, which is when I go out and talk to people and I meet smart, bright, energetic people, which chain are they deploying on? Which chain are they interested in? And um, this used to be Bitcoin in the very early days and, uh, and they were doing stuff. And then they realized very quickly that Bitcoin was not accommodating whatever they wanted to do. And... Um, and then, then they moved to Ethereum, and Ethereum is in a different mode right now. And uh, they're not there, um, at least not, not the ones that I, I get to see. Um, and, uh, and now I am so proud of what's happening on the Avalanche ecosystem. The Avalanche Summit was an insane, insane uh, uh, event. Uh, I've never seen that much energy in the air. And it was like a festival of sorts, kind of like a music festival, you know, amped up with uh, with a big dose of geeky stuff injected into it. But it was amazing. And uh, and now you look at DeFi, you look at what's what's happening where. Uh, so I'll try and, and cover this next 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 time next week. But uh, there's a lot of innovation happening in DeFi uh, on Avalanche, and uh, so you know it's actually much better in my opinion, than what's happening on Ethereum. For everything that you see on ETH, there's a counterpart in a, on Avalanche, and there is something that takes the, the wave front of human knowledge a little further. So, uh, so that's really exciting. Um, and August 2022, all-time highs in daily and monthly transactions. Yeah, it's August is a good month for us. So yeah, this is uh, what it looks like. Um, yeah, so, so that's that. Uh, what else is on my mind? Um, a note about bridging. Let's talk a little bit about uh, bridges. There, Kobe, Kobe ended up posting this thing um, about the BNB chain. Why can't I convert from the BNB chain to other chains? And the re official response for the B from the BNB chain is, right now, our aim is to grow the ecosystem on BNB chain, and therefore, we are only supporting one-way bridging from other chains to BNB chain. If you have only one-way bridging, that's not a bridge. That's a burn and a create, a burn and a mint. So you're burning one asset to create another asset. That second asset is not convertible to the first one. And so I wrote a little, little uh, thread about this. There is a lot of jokes to make. And, uh, and I think uh, Eric Wall I, I ended up posting the funniest picture, which I will not be able to share with you. But... Um, uh, well, I'll skip the obvious jokes. It's it's a one-way trap, obviously. You go through that bridge, there's no coming back. It's kind of like, you know, crossing the Rubicon, burning the bridges, so to speak. And um, uh, you can't go back. So but I'll raise a technical issue. If an asset cannot go both ways across a bridge and do it quickly, then it's a different asset. Why? Because you can't arb the price difference. Uh, what does that mean? So... Uh, you know, it, this you used to have an asset on the origin chain. You destroyed it. You created a new thing on the destination chain. If you cannot, without friction, go backwards to what you used to have, then those two things are separate. They have different life cycles. They're very, very different. 
This goes, by the way, not just for the BNB chain, but for also every L2. If you have an L2 and it takes a week to get your assets out of it, that's kind of a trap. That's a one-way bridge also. I mean, it's the one, it's maybe not one way. Technically, you could go back, but technically you could check out of Hotel California as well, right? Uh, you just couldn't leave. So this is a similar situation. So if arbitrage cannot happen in both directions in a timely manner, that asset will command a different price. And if it commands a different price, then it's completely misleading to label it to be the same thing. You used to have X, now you have the other bridged X. The bridged X is a different life. It's not, it's only a shadow of the thing you burned to create it. It's not the same thing. And because it's not the same thing, there is no expectation that its value should be identical. And this goes for anything. It goes for dollars as well, right? So this is why people are so upset about certain stable coins. If you cannot convert the stable coin back to cash easily, then it should command a different price. It should command a lower price. So uh, anyhow, so this is, uh, this is true for every tech, uh, for transferring assets between any chain or any universe and other universe, uh, including L2s, especially L2s. If you're trapped behind the bridge with a one week delay, the asset you're holding in your hand is not equivalent and uh, you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be pretending that it's equivalent. So uh, what's, what's the takeaway here? My, my advice to you all is to, before you use a system, you should try a two-way transfer back and forth with a small amount. Make sure you can go in easily, which I'm sure the people who want to entice you there, uh, they've made sure that that's easy. But you can also go back easily. If that's taking a week, well, you know, think about what you would do if there is any kind of a system problem. We're going to see an explosion. We are already seeing an explosion of chains. Everybody who's you know, any any idiot can create a chain. Any idiot can create an L2. These days, the bar to create an L2 is incredibly low. They don't even have to be an L2. It's just every single L2 is not an L2 right now. They are just in name only. They are in hopes and dreams only. They don't have fraud proofs. They don't have the zero knowledge uh, proofs. They don't have any way of contesting uh, anything. They're not even, uh, they typically are not, um, don't have proper mechanisms for ensuring data availability. Some do, so that, that's actually easier to ascertain, but certainly uh, none of them have uh, the, the conflict resolution uh, primitives built into them. So, uh, you know, all of them are selling you hopes and dreams. Someday L2 technology will be there, uh, but today you get to execute on somebody's laptop with a promise that they won't misbehave. So um, if you're using one of those systems, you gotta worry about their failure cases. All of these systems will differentiate themselves under duress. When things are going well, when the wind's on your back and the seas are calm, or every boat of the same length will kind of travel at the same, you know, at the same speed. That's not where seaworthiness shows itself. It's in adverse weather, it's with big waves. That's when you want the, the boat that's built like a, like a proper boat. That's when you realize, hey, I'm on a pontoon crap, uh, you know, in the middle of the, the ocean. And somebody led me here saying they will someday build a real ship. But, but this is just a set of pontoons and the, and, the, and the smallest wave will rip this apart. The front will fall off. So, uh, so anyhow, so there are lots of bridge technologies out there. They offer vastly different, different performance. They also offer vastly different failure models. So make sure that you try to at least test it on a good day. And many of them are so bad that even on a good day, you will realize that they're not worth using. So, um, you know, of course, why am I telling you all this? I'm super proud of our bridge. It's number one in terms of market share. That, that is the case for a reason. It's instant, it's easy to use, it's secure, it uses the world's best technologies for ensuring security and depth, and uh, it bridges Avalanche, Ethereum, as well as Bitcoin. And uh, uh, the Bitcoin side is underutilized at the moment. Not that many people know that if you have Bitcoin, you could convert that Bitcoin to BTC.B on Avalanche. You could start sending it really, really fast on Avalanche. Um, you could also use it as collateral in DeFi on Avalanche. We should probably make some, I'll, I'll see if the community members will be up for making some movies about how to do this. So uh, so if you're sitting on BTC, you don't wanna sell. 
well then you could this is a way to to earn some some additional sats with it um anyhow it's really cool stuff go check it out uh i'm really proud of, of the bridge we built it's super fast super easy to use and uh and it's kind of kind of cool okay uh it's the half hour mark i'm going to keep these meetings uh, or discussions a little short i'll keep my rants short if i can no promises i do expect to rant for a long time uh, on, on certain topics that trigger me. I get triggered easily by technical issues. So, um, uh, but anyway, today I managed to finish it in half an hour and I want to, to take some community questions. Um, so um, I did ask what, what, you know, what kinds of questions people had and I want to highlight one of them from uh, Breder. So his question, um, he's, he's worried. A lot of people are now worried about censorship resistance. We always had to worry about censorship resistance. This is nothing new. We always had to worry about decentralization. It is these cases that, that really highlight why we're here, right? As I said, when the, when the wind's on your back and the seas are smooth, every boat of the same length kind of travels at the same speed. So it's, it's really when you start getting the waves that you realize, hey, you know, this is different. So he's saying, look, what happens if some hacker bridges some, some USDC to Avalanche and Circle freezes those USDC held by the bridge? He is assuming that Circle cannot freeze those USDC.e. So let's, let's cover this. Um, uh, let me preface this by saying that I didn't look at the uh, Circle uh, smart contract on Ethereum, the original one on Ethereum, the USDC smart contract. I'm going to assume it's the same as the Tether contract. Okay, so uh, uh, so that's a reasonable assumption. They, they're probably pretty comparable. Um, so, and then he assumes that Circle cannot freeze USDC.e. That is a correct assumption. USDC.e is a, a wrapped asset, and um, and so uh, uh, so this uh, USDC is bridged to Avalanche, and then the, the USDC.e is created automatically uh, during the bridging process. Now. Those bridged, uh, bridged assets are pooled at the bridge address. So it's just a regular, uh, regular address controlled by a private key and um, uh, that a private key that's secured by the SGX technologies. So, um, uh, so if, if let's say a thousand or let's say, let's say a hundred thousand people are using the bridge, all of those assets are residing at uh, at one location, and we don't have a hundred thousand of those things on the original chain. Um, is that right? Hang on, before I say this, uh, let me think about this. Yeah, we do not have all hundred thousand of these things on the original chain at a hundred thousand different addresses. They get pooled at the time of bridging so that they can be paid out when people uh, go re in the reverse direction off the bridge. So. Um, if this were to happen and Circle wants to, to freeze something, if they are using the same structure as Tether, um, the freezing operation is limited to, uh, to the, the address basis. So what that means is uh, Tether can freeze the assets at a given address, either in whole or none at all. And as far as I know, Tether does not have a partial freeze function. So... Uh, the same is true for Avalanche, um, would be true for Avalanche. If, if Circle is using the same kind of structure, which I would suspect that they would, um, then, uh, then, um, uh, then, uh, uh, then the same would be true for Circle as well. So um, that leads us to the second scenario that, um, that uh, he's interested in, which is uh, suppose a hacker interacts with a BTC mixer, then bridges, um, and the entire avalanche bridge is blacklisted. So essentially all of these boil down to a worry about, um, about people blacklisting the bridge address because one single bad actor touched the bridge. This could in, in theory happen. Um, there's, you know, in theory, anything can happen. Uh, and it's the same as worrying that because there is a bad user at Binance that, um, uh, that uh, that money paid out by Binance is forever forever tainted. Could that happen? Yes, it could happen. But at this point, it seems to me, at least, uh, that it would be it would create incredible chaos to try to to for anybody to do censorship at this level. We don't see this happening. There is no precedent for it. 
Uh, we don't see anybody asking for this kind of censorship. Um, and uh, if one were to try to do something like this, uh, it would end up being so unfair to so many people that the uh, the outcry, the public outcry, would uh, would cause an issue. Um, now, the the other question, of course, is who's doing the blacklisting, right? So, if there is an entity that wants to say, "Hey, I'm not going to touch any money that has touched Binance," then uh, there's nothing anyone else can do about that person, right? So, if there is if there is an exchange, let's say Poloniex says we're not going to touch money coming from Binance because this one guy sent sent money to Binance, you know, stolen money, stolen coins to Binance, and we're going to we're going to blacklist Binance um, or you know replace Binance with the bridge if you like. Somebody used the bridge, somebody bad used the bridge, um, and therefore that address is on the chain of uh, of uh, uh, of addresses that this coin has been through, and we're going to now apply censorship transitively. Well, first of all, you know, this is, again, I get, come back to the same thing. It's a terrible way to try to do enforcement because taint ends up spreading exponentially through these systems. Every, every coin you could potentially touch today has been, uh, unless it was just minted, has been through Binance. So, uh, so this would be a bad, bad idea. And um, the second thing is if somebody doesn't want to take that coin, there's nothing we can do about that person. They, they are free to do so. That's, that's their prerogative. Um, the question, the other question that we should really ask is how, how would that person who wants to censor somebody turn that censorship and apply it at the layer one level? How would they be able to go and change and make sure that uh, the consensus protocol does not accept transactions that involve Binance or the bridge or what have you? So that's a very interesting question. And, um, and every protocol uh, has some resilience properties and, and, uh, uh, and we should talk about those in more depth uh, when it comes to, you know, to, to maybe a future date. But, um, uh, but in the case of proof of work coins, I think I mentioned this last week a little bit. In the case of proof of work coins, if this person who wants to do this kind of censorship can convince three um, of the biggest miners in Bitcoin, they can censor. If this person can convince like three to four of the biggest miners in Ethereum, they can do censorship. If this person can convince the number one, just one of the, uh, uh, the hosting providers for Ethereum nodes, then they can censor staking providers for Ethereum. They can censor. For Avalanche, I am so proud to report that we are highly decentralized with nodes all across the globe on every continent except Antar Antarctica. And if you're in Antarctica and you have a node um, and, uh, and you want to join the network, do let me know. Um, I, I'll send you some swag and uh, I'd love to get Antarctica on our list of, uh, list of places where we run a node. Um, but anyway, that aside, aside. Um, so we have nodes everywhere in across across all continents, across all jurisdictions. We have a, a stake distribution that's incredibly decentralized, and we have one of the best Gini coefficients in the industry. Um, we uh, I haven't been tracking recently, but for the longest time we had the highest number of validators counted properly. So there are other people. Who are, there's always for every metric, there's some idiot out there trying to game that metric, and. Um, uh, you know, for TPS was something that people cared about. And then you had Solana, uh, you know, gaming that number. Um, and then validators, number of validators is something that people care about. And now we have a redefinition of the word validator. So uh, I'm going to disregard those. So uh, if you disregard that and you look at unique node IPs, um, we had one of the largest networks. We had one of the most decentralized networks with some of the best stake distribution across these nodes. So I'm really proud of, um, of our decentralization. And I think I alluded to this last time. Uh, I need to look at this much more scientifically to give you actual numbers on what it would take to, to apply censorship to any given address. I think that's really the issue. Um, but circle freezing USDC held by the bridge would not, it seems like it's, it's, it's not one of my concerns. It's not something they would do. And, uh, and the other kind of thing is somebody trying to blacklist. I don't worry about that. If somebody wants to do some dumb, dumb thing like that, that's fine. It only affects their, their silly service. Um, what I do care about is, is the substrate, is the infrastructure. 
are they able to do that at the infrastructure level? And on that front, I am really proud of, uh, of what we've built and I know that it's quite capable of withstanding these kinds of attacks. All right, so let me get back here and take a look at the questions. Um, hello from Avalanche World, hello back. Can listen for hours. I can I can rant for hours, so we, we can we can we can have a happy happy convo here. Where can we download the Core Wallet? You can go to the Chrome Store and check it out. It's it's cool. It's uh, it's super fast. And uh, uh, oh, I should tell you this: um, the there was a recent NFT mint, the um, uh, con conspicuous conscious lines, conspicuous lines. I forget which one it is right now. But um, uh, it was a great artist. The artwork is amazing. And um, the mint sold out. It was, it was highly priced. It was five, five AVAX per, per NFT. And um, the artist uh, is coming over from ETH to Avalanche. And uh, uh, all of the NFTs were minted within 15 seconds. And if you were using MetaMask, it was just too slow. You could not mint with it. You had to be using Chrome, uh, sorry, you had to be using Core uh, on, on Chrome uh, or maybe somewhere else as well. I don't know if we support other browsers at the moment. We might not. But you had to be using Core uh, to be able to really take advantage of it. I'm thrilled about that. Um, the Core Core app is evolving rapidly also. It is exactly the wallet experience that I want new people to have. And uh, EGS, oh, hi, Bill Gabe. Much love, much love back. Um, core app is, app is incredible. Um, if you can share how long until mobile core app, uh, not much, not much time at all. So um, I've been playing with uh, the advanced copies of the of the mobile core app, the, the what we call core mobile. I've been playing with that app. It's a standalone uh, mobile wallet, and um, uh, and uh, we are we're getting there. So uh, I can't announce dates. The team will kill me. But, uh, but not far from now at all. Um, so support from all sorts of places, thank you. It is impossible to return to MetaMask after trying Core only once. That's so true, I, so true for Avalanche as well. Like once you use Avalanche, it becomes really hard to use Ethereum with its slow fin finality. Such a big difference uh, once you get used to this new fast stuff. Um, what happened to Bitcoin Satoshi? Yeah, I wonder. Um, that's that's the that's the movie. What happened to Bitcoin Satoshi? New token funded film aims to find out. That's right. Um, so, uh, I wonder what Vitalik is thinking about Avalanche. Are you still on good terms? Of course, I do text him every now and then, and uh, we have a nice uh, channel. I'm not going to name the name of it because I don't want people trying to figure out where 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 it is. With a bunch of these founders of different coins. And uh, Vitalik is somebody I hold in very high regard. And uh, uh, yeah, there's some kind of tension every now and then. And, um, you know, it'll that'll happen. It'll go, uh, you know, we're, we're occasionally upset at, uh, at Ethereum maxis and how, uh, uh, how Vitalik doesn't actually rein them in. Uh, he's occasionally upset at, uh, at us, but I'm proud of the way that I think we've, we've managed our community. Uh, you don't see our community attacking Ethereum. There are technical differences. There is nothing I can do to muzzle what I think. Um, I always thought ETH2 was a bad design. I always said this, and um, uh, I, I don't. I have a lot of technical differences, but uh, we're all on the same boat. We're all on the EVM boat. I also don't believe the L2 vision. I think it's miss. It's oversold. It's, it's there's no vision. Um, it's just a bunch of you know, just do what you want kind of a thing. That's that's not a vision. So, um, but you know, power to them. I can't wait for the merge. It's going to be great after the merge because we will stop hearing about the merge. Um, so, um, right. Why are people so blinded by proof of stake? Exactly. It's kind of weird. People are used to proof of work. They think it's secure. It's, it's you know, all of that work is being done by just a small number of miners. So you're really beholden to a very small num number of mining pool operators. And those mining pools, the miners in the mining pools are ever, ever increasing in size. You can't be a small sized Bitcoin miner these days. It, you used to be able to, even maybe four years ago you could, but not anymore. It's it's real big business. The profit margins are still okay, but uh, it's it's a tough business. So um, it's, uh, 
it's a very different world. Um, yeah, so I don't know why they keep saying that. It's uh, it's really proof of stake where the action is at. Could I please make a small video about bridging BTC into Avalanche and joining one of the LPs to get a four to five percent APY over BTC on Trader Joe, for example? Yes, I can do this. I can get people to do this. Um, Ava Labs has a bunch of designers. They're very cool, by the way. Every time I talk to one of the designers, I'm just super impressed. And I, I think about, can I get this person to help me with, you know, I don't know, designing the crap behind me or whatnot. Uh, they're amazing people. They, they just, they look the part. They sound like the part. They, they think about, you know, deeper, deeper things when it comes to interaction than you and I do. Um, so yeah, I could, I could ask them to do it. Better yet, why don't one of you guys do it? And, um, you know, I'll send you an NFT. Just, just do it. Show people how to do it. It's, uh, it's eminently possible. You just screenshot yourself doing it, um, talk over it, and uh, send it to me in DMs. And uh, I'll gladly retweet it. And I'll send, you, I'll send you swag or NFT or maybe both. I'll send you some stuff. How about that? Um, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll also ask the designers. They're, at any given time, they're incredibly busy. But I'll ask one of the designers to make a movie uh, that shows how to do this. Uh, what about the Unreal Wallet? I don't know. I haven't looked at it. What are the next steps for the development of Avalanche from a tech point of view? Oh, my God. Uh, how much time do I have? 12 minutes. Um, what we should expect, in what order, and what are the challenges to get there? What a great question, Vlad. And um, I want to do it justice, so I don't want to. I don't want to do it off off the top of my head. I have. I am not a big fan of roadmaps. I think roadmaps are abused all the time. I think systems should sell themselves as they are. I think you should. You should look at what something is doing right now, and if you like what it's doing and what it's poised to do next, then you you should you should be part of it or not. But you should not get into a coin with a uh, with a ten year ten year plan, thinking that they'll be able to deliver. I mean, I've seen time and time again. I'm not going to name names here, but we've seen time and time again that people sell hopes and dreams, and uh, and then the system never materializes. And so um, it's it's mostly a reaction to that that I decided, hey, we're not going to have we're not going to be in the business of selling to people something that's going to happen in the future. So. Um, so I try to avoid this, and um, uh, we underpromise, overdeliver, and uh, we are, I think, the fastest moving project in the space. So, uh, uh, so, but you know, it's a fair question, right? So let me try to give you the the, the high level view. Our platform is going to be evolving. It's going to be evolving at a pretty rapid pace, such that it's uh, it gets faster. That Per, uh, per transaction, gas costs go down and the TPS numbers go up. There are a bunch of things that are happening behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, anyone can contribute to the code, of course. Um, I, I can only tell you the kinds of things that I'm working on. So one of the things that, that can happen in this space are much better databases. Another thing that can happen are much better execution engines. So those at the platform level can give us uh, extra oomph, extra speed on any given single chain. We have the architecture that allows us to have many chains in parallel, and you're seeing that uh, play a big role when it comes to these all-time high numbers. So that's what's happening on the platform front, forever evolving, forever getting faster with new core components. On the bridging front, uh, we introduced the world's fastest, uh, coolest bridge based on SGX technology. We are the first people to bring SGX. We built the world's most valuable SGX application. Uh, we're best buddies with Intel as a result. Um, and um, it's been a fantastic collaboration there. Uh, there's much more to be done there. There's much more to do with SGX and there's much more to do with bridging. Uh, you're going to see us bridge to uh, other chains. The biggest problem with us bridging to other chains is the security of other chains. I don't want to jeopardize anybody on Avalanche by bridging from a chain that can go backwards. So imagine that I took one of these crappy chains. Uh, there, there is one that I'm not going to name, the one that goes backwards once a day. And I allowed you to bridge. Well, then, you know, and then they went backwards. Oh, then the bridged funds would be unbacked. And that would create a huge problem for us. So 
so we need to be very careful. So I can't, the, the thing that's, that's limiting me the most is my faith and trust in the origin chains. Um, but otherwise we have the world's coolest bridge technologies. Then there's all sorts of things happening at just about every other front. So we have the new wallet coming up. We, the, the, core, the browser extension is far better than MetaMask. Uh, there's core mobile coming up. That's really exciting. There are new, um, uh, what should I say? New, uh, new applications coming up on top. Some of them are different kind of, kinds of DEXs. So you're familiar with Uniswap perhaps. Uh, there's Dexalot on top of Avalanche that's coming up. There is, um, there is other technologies that uh, I can't announce yet that, uh, that make the exchange, the decentralized exchange experience much better, much, much faster, much higher performance. So that's what, uh, what's going on. So uh, uh, what else is happening? Uh, there is a lot of new asset types being created on top of Avalanche. We're bringing a lot of other people into the space, and I'm really proud of the role that we're playing there. Um, unlike L2s, we're not here to scavenge Ethereum. We're here to build additional value and to bring them, bring new people into the EVM fold. And uh, so ILOs are one of them. ILOs are about to take off soon with much larger numbers of uh, cases. FFOs are starting. Those are really exciting. And, uh, and there's much more to be done. So uh, uh, let's move on. Uh, let me see. Um, can I say something about the energy crisis concerning nodes in Germany? Uh, is there any risk? There are a lot of nodes in Germany. Yeah, there are a lot of avalanche nodes in Germany. Um, yeah, there is an energy crisis. Um, so uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a bit of a problem. And um, uh, that I, I, I shudder to think what's going to happen in Europe this fall. That's a separate issue. I'm worried about uh, sort of geopolitical things, of course, like everybody else. Um, but there was a case, I think this question is referring to this case today, where a hosting provider decided to shut down all Ethereum nodes, uh, saying that, um, that uh, all, 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 all ETH nodes are forbidden. And in saying so, they also said, I, we don't care if it's proof of work or proof of stake. We just don't want you on our systems. I think that's crazy. It's, it's insane. I don't know why they're saying that. I don't know why they're thinking that. And... Um, uh, the only thing that I can, I've been thinking about this this morning, the only thing I can attribute this to is, is uh, fatigue from years and years of abuse from proof of work. So proof of work is really destruct destructive. And if you care about the planet, if you have kids, if you care about kids, if you care about your future or our future or someone else's future, then, then you should try not to interact with chains that rely on proof of work. And Ethereum today is one of those chains. And, uh, and may, my, what I think is happening here is that these folks are sick and tired and, and they're just saying, look, we're just going to put the kibush on, on all everything cryptocurrency. This thing is far, far, consumes a crap ton of energy, millions and millions of households worth of energy. So I think the energy consumption of Ethereum is 1.6 million households. Uh, Bitcoin is 4 point something million households. And... Um, Avalanche is 46 households. That's it, 46. So, you know, you could leave the back back porch light on or you could turn it off and run an avalanche node. It's about the same. You know, it's just, it's so light. So I don't think anybody should have a concern about a proper proof of stake system. And, um, and the fact that there is anger here, I, I, I sense resentment and anger coming from that hosting provider. I think it's spillover from proof of work. I think we're going to live with that, uh, or Ethereum will have to live with that because of its legacy. They were POW for the longest time. The merge was supposed to happen five, six years ago. So, uh, so I think they, they're just kind of reaping uh, the, the, the fruits of, of that, uh, that delay there. Uh, it's sad, though. As a technologist, I would want those people to not be emotional. I would want them to calm down and look at the science. And Ethereum, once it does the merge, should be a proper, reasonable, uh, modern system that is based on proof of stake. It's still going to be slow, uh, but um, uh, you know, finality is going to be very low. Very, very time to finality will be very long time. But uh, but it's still it's at least not going to be consumptive of energy. And so hosting providers should change their minds on it and allow people to to host Ethereum nodes as long as they they support only POS. 
Okay, um, can you check my people want to reach me? Yeah, um, so I, uh, I, was, I, I was very, very tired at the beginning of the summer, as I'm sure many of you were as well. The uh, launch fatigue, uh, pandemic fatigue and so on kind of got to me. So uh, I, I took some time this summer to recharge and, um, and I haven't been able to, to catch up to my messages. If you wrote to me, I probably didn't write back to you. I apologize. I post every day on Twitter. I don't go into my DMs. Um, you know, it's just there just isn't time enough in the day to read and respond to them. I apologize. And uh, uh, try to get to me through a friend or something who knows me. Uh, that's the way to get my attention. Otherwise, hopefully I'll find some time in the next month or so to, to get to stuff. What do I think about Fed's uh, way about inflation? Oh, that's easy. It's just get paddled. You get paddled until... Uh, until you, uh, um, until you, uh, you know, until we all improve our morale. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's that's kind of what they're doing. Uh, I don't know. I know you don't support it, but why? And is there any way to? Con yeah, there's a way to control inflation. The way to control inflation is to raise interest rates. As they raise interest rates, the all asset prices tend to go down. People tend to sell speculative assets and end up going into treasuries. So. Uh, uh, companies start spending less and we go through one of these boom and bust cycles. And um, the Fed seems determined that for, for the Fed's policies to succeed, they have to do things, to, they have to do two things. They have to inflict some pain by raising interest rates and they have to be credible about inflicting pain in the future. They have to credibly scare us. So it's a game of hitting the person a little bit and then it's a game of telling the person that you're going to hit them in the future as well. So they don't, they don't get too exuberant and start spending and, and start letting inflation go out of control. So that's what the Fed is doing. And today Powell talked. And uh, again, he was, uh, he was a, an inflation hawk. He talked a lot about how he is going to hit us even more. And, uh, and when, uh, uh, when he does that, then, of course, you see the kind of sell off that we had today. Um, you know, they need to do what they need to do. Uh, they seem to always be behind the times. They seem to always be slow to react. They come, you know, they, they ended up inflating the crap out of the supply. They shouldn't have done that. And now they are clinching the crap out of the same supply. And uh, uh, chances are they're going to over, overshoot. And then we're going to be in for a recession or at least very tough times. That's what Powell said. And there's going to be misery on the streets. People will lose jobs. And, um, uh, you know, older workers will get laid off. They will never be able to find a job. They'll fall out of the workforce. And all sorts of terrible things that happen uh, during, uh, you know, during these one of these uh, recessive cycles will happen. So I don't know what to say about this. It's just the way of the, of the world when it comes to central bankers. And um, uh, we just have to live through this. I think at some point they will realize that the economy is actually changing structurally. The pandemic was a catalyst and we're going from different kinds of work to, to a different kind of economy. We're not going to be a physical presence economy for that much longer. Yes, there's a move to get people back into the office, but no, it's not going to be to the same extent as it was before the pandemic. So um, during that restructuring, and then so a bunch of jobs will move overseas right, as they have been for some time. So as that transition happens, um, it's going to be really interesting and there's going to be a bunch of inefficiencies, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, you just give these guys time. They will play around. They will cause a they might cause a recession. I hope not, but they, they seem determined to. Um, and if they do, then after some time, they have to let go and open up the spigots again. And then that's when you end up getting your business boom cycle. And, um, and that's sort of, uh, you know, in textbooks, this is what they discuss and they say it's inevitable. Um, it's empirically, obviously inevitable. I think empirically, central bankers suck at what they do and they, can't, they don't seem to be able to, uh, to smooth out these cycles. They seem predetermined to go into them. Uh, Conscious Lines, thank you, by Gabe Weiss. Gabe is fantastic, yes. Am I the Messiah? Okay, no, I am not the Messiah. Um, can the new coins give free airdrops to the delegators? Yes, why don't they? That would be cool, they should. Um, people don't airdrop as much as they used to anymore. They, they should, I'd love to see more of that happen. I'll talk to the new projects that are issuing coins about more airdrops. It would be good for the community. 
uh, delegators and validators would be fantastic. Validators of uh, subnets should get should get airdrops. That would be great. Um, default networks and the fungibility of, of AVAX. Can we add a subnet or two to the default network to use ZK snarks or ring CTs to obfuscate transactions? Yes, you could. You could create your own subnet with uh, with ZK snarks or ring CTs or what have you, whatever whatever anonymity technology you might want to introduce, it's possible to do in a subnet. And uh, you could then bridge AVAX there, do what you want and bring it back. So uh, eminently doable and lots and lots of fun to do. And uh, you could easily take the um, Zcash code maybe. Um, I don't think they are at the forefront of science. I think uh, there are better technologies than what's in Z what was in Zcash when I last looked at it, I should put it that way. Um, I like Zcash quite a bit. I think they did one more upgrade after I looked at it. So maybe they are at the forefront. I'm not sure. But you could take their code and run it as an avalanche avalanche uh, subnet. And if you did that, it, it, was, it would work so much faster because you don't and you don't have any mining. Um, that would be a lot of fun. You could change the founder's reserve, end up rewarding the validators if you want. That's all up to you. Um, so uh, well, there's so many questions. Are there plans to put the E2A bridge into a subnet to increase the number of wardens? Not at the moment. Uh, wardens would be something like validators. It, yes, but, uh, but then the same person can, can create a gazillion, gazillion wardens and take over. That's the reason why we haven't done that. Um, otherwise, this use of subnets as a, as a means of um, tracking group membership uh, would be is a good idea. So you know, when you, group membership is a technical term. It refers to managing a set of uh, of, of nodes. So uh, this is a good idea, Hassan. And um, uh, there are currently no plans because you'd have to solve the Sybil problem. If the same entity ends up uh, ends up um, uh, flooding the subnet, then then they would have you know too much say in uh, in in the operation of the bridge. And uh, you don't want to make that process open. I always would want to have someone with an actual neural network do some kind of analysis on who these wardens are. Um, we should add a subnet to the default network to communicate between the other subnets. Yeah, Stephen, you're so right. We should probably have uh, some kind of technology to, um, uh, to provide uh, things similar to um, cross-chain cross -chain communication layer, a universal cross-chain communication layer. So um, we're working on this. This is something that's actually on the roadmap that I, you know, the, the, the roadmap that I tried to disclose a little bit, but, but obviously did a, a terribly imperfect job of. There are a gazillion different components that uh, I have a hand in. It's, well, this is one of those. And um, it's interesting. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's totally doable. And it's something that, that we're working on. There's some cool crypto ideas that one can use to, um, to, uh, uh, to make this more uh, streamlined. It would probably be a great idea to speak with Sergey. Yes, I didn't read the rest of your sentence. It's always a great idea to speak with Sergey. Um, Sergey and I go back go back a while and I happen to enjoy talking to him every time I talk to him. Well, I mean, talk to him quite often, I think. And uh, every conversation is a lot of fun. About how we can help Chainlink on this cross-chain communication layer that they're trying to create a standard for. I've been talking to Sergey about how to help him with... Um, with decentralizing and organizing his um, uh, his decentralized network of oracles, so that would be really cool. Imagine multiple subnets of oracles, and um, you know, suppose uh, and suppose you have data to to publish. You could run different subnets and um, at different speeds. So uh, you could post to one subnet, let's say the C chain, once a minute with some prices, uh, but you could run another chain. Uh, with much more beefy machines and with much less other stuff happening on it where you post every second. So uh, it's possible to have this, you know, this gradation of service levels with subnets. This is something that I've been talking to Sergey about. And um, I think his hands are, are full and uh, they are trying to deliver on their promises to their community. So I'm not sure when they're going to get to this, but if I were him and I were doing this from scratch, I know exactly how I would structure my network. It would be uh, as a series, as a collection of avalanche subnets. Uh, do I have Ted locked in a basement working on mangrove deep here? 
<laughs> I should have Ted locked in a basement working on mangrove DB. Ted, okay, the truth is, Ted works so hard that he locks himself in a basement working on mangrove DB without me having to lock lock him in a in a basement. So yes, he's a uh, he's uh, he graduated. Got his his doctor Ted Yin now. Uh, this this Ted Yin, for those of you who don't know him, is um, a former student of mine. And uh, when he was in his second or third year, in his third year, I believe, he went to Silicon Valley for the summer and um, worked on a project, came back and said, hey, I worked on a cool project. And uh, this is neat and all, but I want to work on something really innovative. The cool thing that he worked on is a system called Hot Stuff. And it's the system that lies at the heart of, um, of uh, that lied at the heart of, uh, of uh, Facebook's um, Libra which was then renamed to a whole bunch of other things and then sold off, et cetera. But there are now two copies uh, uh, of, uh, of Libra. I believe they're still using hot stuff. So that's, that's what Ted worked on. And then when he came back and said, hey, I want to work on something that's really innovative. And ever since he's been working on Avalanche. So uh, that's pretty cool. And uh, yes, he's working on Mangrove DV, DB as well as other stuff. And um, uh, he's incredibly good at writing code. Uh, uh, fast. He's a great, great hacker. Um, so, uh, so can't wait to see uh, to see what uh, what he has in store for me when I next talk to him. I implore the AVAX community to add the option to have secret smart contracts and privacy transactions in a default network that we can cross chain transfer into and out of. Uh, I I agree. Um, you know, this is uh, this is eminently doable. There are umpteen different ways of doing this. I've been thinking about this um, and. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so it's, um, it's really interesting. How can you host a voting platform without privacy? You can't. So, uh, um, yeah, so Stephen, you are so right. I think we're going to see a lot of, uh, renewed interest in privacy technologies of different kinds. Um, and, uh, but it doesn't have to be a default net. I don't know what a default network is. I keep telling my team that the only special network is the P chain the one for coordination. And the C, the X, these are all, all just like the DFK or whatever else. So all of those other ones are at the same level. And um, uh, anyone can do this. So I, I am not, it's permission, it's entirely permissionless. There's no gatekeeper. Uh, there's nobody to hold you back if you want to do this. Uh, it's certainly something that I'm really, uh, really uh, excited about. You don't have to implore, implore me, Stephen. It's something that I already love and something that I think about on a daily basis. Um, a real privacy solution. Yes, good vibes, I agree. Um, so some people on Twitter complain that Avalanche compared to other chains is not much known, especially in South America. Are there any marketing initiatives planned? Uh, I don't know what that's, uh, yeah, that's like the, the bane of my existence. Um, yeah, we are, a, we are, we never used influencers, right? I never traveled to Mongolia with a falcon on my arm. I would love to do that, but I never did. Um, we never went to Chinese farmers and sold the idea of a chain that in the future will do X, Y, Z, then you should buy the coins now, et cetera. We didn't do that. Um, we never bought TikTok influencers and so on. So, um, uh, so we never did that. And therefore the techies know us and other people don't know us. And uh, so what do we do from here? Um, yeah, so we have to do marketing. Um, we, the technology has been so good that it has sold itself. And um, do I need to go there and do a TikTok dance and, you know, like do this stuff? I don't think so. Um, you know, I will if you guys want me to. But, uh, but it seems like the tech should really sell itself. If you've got a compelling product, it sells itself. So uh, I don't think you're going to see me doing that. Um, but, uh, but I do want to get the word out more broadly. And I... I in Stephen's words, I implore you all to help me on that. So um, I need you to be in a very respectful fashion, uh, proselytize, and uh, get the word out about Avalanche, and get the word out that this is the chain where the most technological innovation is happening. That's the simple truth. So people can go and make asinine bets on uh, centralized chains or you know whatever what have you, but if they want something that actually has a technical chance of succeeding at digitizing the world's assets, then this is the place. So let's get the word out on that front. Um, 
So subnet Z for zero knowledge. Yes, ZK subnet. Yes, brilliant. Indeed, I fully agree, guys. Totally agree. Um, what do I think about uh, the tech behind SUI and Altos? I, I think you just heard me uh, discuss the tech behind SUI and Altos. It's my, my students' work, so I have to love it. I love it. Oh, Ted, of course, sorry. Ted invented that. He then came back, finished his PhD, uh, became Dr. Ted Yin, and uh, is currently with Ava Labs. Uh, he's one of the three founding members of Ava Labs, and uh, one of them being me. The other is Kevin Sekniki. And um, uh, Ted uh, Ted's work is now... Uh, the foundation for SUI and Altos. And I looked into what they're doing. Um, you know, I haven't had a chance to look into the code yet. The move virtual machine looks good to me. It's a fine idea. Uh, you know, does the world need another virtual machine? Yes, all of the existing ones are terrible. Is move the best one? I don't know. It looks okay. It looks better than the ones that exist. Um, but is it substantially better? No, I don't see something that says, hey, get this, that you can do something with this that you couldn't do with the EVM. I don't see that there. There are less chances for things to go wrong, it seems, maybe, perhaps, but the, the tech, the code is so untested that, that those theoretical advantages are vastly inferior to the pragmatic advantages of the EVM. So here we are. Uh, and Move has also the problem that nobody, nobody, uh, nobody knows how to write code for that that ecosystem. There is no ecosystem. If one develops, I would be one of the, I will be one of the first ones to create the M subnet to that supports the Move virtual machine. It's super easy for us, uh, but um, at the moment it seems like all untested code. Um, a lot of what I see from Sui and Altos seems really, the, this is the other thing I should mention, seems really tech oriented. I'm going to go for a while. Uh, I should have been done about an hour, about six minutes ago. I'm going to talk for another half hour. I, I, I'm enjoying today. And uh, this was good to have it open. Um, so let me get this point across. You triggered the rant. So uh, here's the rant. There are chains where the people behind them are really, they, they really understand the technology. They are true believers and they have a vision for what's what's to come. And then there are chains uh, of different kinds where there is a limited vision and a limited play. Now, in the short term, you can't tell which one is which, and they both could be could could you know they could they could make people rich either way, right? But one of the, the one of the most big most important classes of the of the latter kind is the kind of system built by techies for techies. These are invariably located and centered and headquartered in the Bay Area. These are always started by people who see blockchains as a kind of a database. And, uh, and it's an asinine play where these people are serial entrepreneurs or something like that, where uh, uh, they have done a bunch of little projects and they want to do yet another one, this time a slightly, slightly faster, you know, memcashty. Right? That's what that's how they see it, and that's what they're going to do. Oh, you know, by the way, it has a slightly different instruction set. It has a slightly different, you know, it's not stack based. It's more register based, what have you. So, so suddenly you get something like Sui and Altos. Um, I think to, for something to be successful in this late stage in the game, you need to have a much broader vision than I invented the same same mousetrap as everybody else with just slightly different machinery underneath. So what's the vision? I don't know. It seems like a tech play to me. And um, as soon as I hear headquartered in San Francisco, as soon as I hear, you know, uh, these people were at Facebook formerly, you know, something in me just dies and I turn off, the, I just kind of squelch it down and you know, it's just, it's a no-go from me. So, uh, so let's see how they, they fare. There are some talented technical people there. Uh, but I don't understand the vision. I don't know what they're going to do that hasn't been done before. I don't see them doing something. Uh, like they, well, well, they're not pushing the needle for me to get excited. So what could they do that, that one cannot already do with what we've got? I don't know. So I read a lot of their materials, and I don't see what's happening. It's just, it's just more of the same from people with a big company background. And... Uh, so, and one of them is already suing the other, et cetera. All of the big company, uh, you know, drama is already taking place. So it's exactly as expected. I, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I don't have much, much hope for this. Um, 
Okay, what else is going on? When BTC bridge airdrop? Yeah, um, that's an idea. Why not? Um, so I will, well, I'll think about that. Somebody should do that. I would like to please write a letter to you about these things. Stephen, this is so easy. You don't have to uh, well, ask for permission. Yes, you can message me to get an email or some. Yes, my, my email is open. I read all of the emails that come in. And uh, that's why I'm behind and I cannot answer all of them is, is I do try to read all of them. So it sounds like you're very passionate about this. And um, uh, so I will I will gladly read whatever you, you say and and try to provide uh, mentorship, advice, direction, what what have you to to make something happen. If you if you're interested in these topics of building a new subnet. Um, so. Uh, um, uh, how many tokens for a TikTok? <laughs> I don't know. Let's not talk about this. Um, so no, 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 that don't put, flash that on the screen. Um, there's a way to do it with integrity and without TikTok. I agree. Let's TikTok and integrity. Um, they don't seem to go well together. Uh, okay. Uh, the AMAX TikTok is lit. Yes, it's, uh, it should be. I don't know what, what it is, but it probably is. Did I, do I have a solution for MEV? No, nobody has a solution for MEV. It's a, it's a fundamentally difficult problem. I do not envy uh, Ethereum 2 because uh, MEV problems will, uh, will cause uh, a lot of attacks at the platform level. Um, I'm concerned about those, but I don't have anything else to say to, about that. Um, MEV, the, 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 what we need for MEV discussion, I, here's what I, I dislike this entire topic, discussing this entire topic. I feel like I don't have enough vocabulary at my disposal. I, I feel like the science is just not there to discuss MEV in a rational fashion. So we need a lot more work. We've barely scratched the surface. So um, that, that's what needs to be. The definitions are terrible. Uh, it was a uh, minor extractable value. Now it's maximal extractable value. Da, da, da. It's just, uh, it's just you know, we lack the proper vocabulary. We lack metrics for uh, comparing designs. So if I were to say something, somebody else will say something, and then suddenly I'm talking to some some idiot who thinks they know everything, uh, you know, and and you know they think they they they're they're saying whatever it is. It ends up be, turning into a conversation that's that that cannot be evaluated objectively. It's just a bunch of words from random people and a big waste of time. So uh, no, it's it's a very hard problem to solve. And uh, the the difficulty is you want to reduce activities by bad people, uh, activities that harm retail, activities that create an undemocratic environment, so to speak, in a very loose fashion. You want to to take those back while maximizing people's ability to do whatever the heck they want. So it's one of these, you know, ban bad things while allow as many good things to happen kind of a setups that's, uh, that's very hard. So you might end up curtailing things that you, uh, you want to have take place. And so finding that right balance is going to be very tough for anyone. So um, uh, in, in, in the absence of a good framework, in the absence of scientific work um, of high quality, we end up being unable to compare designs. So it's going to require some time to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to discuss, to, do, to, to have the right tools to discuss this. Um, so uh, uh, let's see, I've lost my space, where are we? Um, please get, give Kevin some permission to leak one piece of alpha every month. Oh God, I don't have to give him, I don't. I never give him any permission to leak any alpha. He keeps leaking stuff left and right. Um, every 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 time there's a discussion of any secret stuff, we have to say, "Hey, Kevin, this is secret. Did you get it?" And then and then every time he says, "Yes, but why are you picking on me?" And uh, we keep having to to reiterate that he can't leak stuff. Anyway, he's a uh, he's a uh, it's uh, yeah. Don't uh, loose lips sink ships or something. And uh, Kevin's uh, Kevin's gonna he's leaking he's leaking alpha left and right. Um, so Danny, Danny is wonderful, thank you. Um, we could port a Cosmos app called Kujira on Avalanche. Yes, uh, okay. So I would love to see more apps crossing over from, uh, from Cosmos. It's just, that sounds great. I, I think um, there's a lot of interesting work that happens on these, uh, well, especially on Rust. 
um, that's, uh, uh, you know, I've looked at some. There's a lot of stuff that's happening on, on, in, in, in Cosmos. That's just a, a bad copy of EVM stuff. Uh, but um, uh, I'd love to see Kujira on. That would be fantastic. Uh, why did you choose total supply of 720 million? Um, it's a nice number. It's uh, divisible by 60. 60 was the number base in uh, the Sumerian uh, uh, civilization and on. It's divisible by just about every number you might imagine. And uh, uh, it's uh, initially it was going to be 20 million. And then we thought, okay, well, this thing can easily be worth so much that uh, it puts people off. Uh, the per unit price becomes so high and people don't realize they can buy fractions, etc. So let's pick a larger number. Uh, that's again, highly divisible, etc. And easy to sort of think about. So that's why we picked that number. Um, what is my take on WebAssembly? I looked at it, it's, it's terrible. Um, so Wasm is, uh, is a big mess and a nightmare. It doesn't support integers. So um, no, it doesn't support strings or whatever. It, it doesn't support some basic data types. I forget which one it doesn't support. But um, I looked into it. The, the two big issues is the default data types were, were weird. And the default runtime is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is messy. And um, we have a Wasm VM that we built as a prototype. And um, uh, if there are enough people who want to, to write code for Wasm, we have the VM, we could turn it, turn it out, and then we'd have a W, w subnet uh, in a flash. So uh, we haven't done this because I have no faith in those interpreters. I have no faith in their security. And um, I don't see anything that's compelling that's, that compiles down to Wasm for which we don't have a counterpart on, uh, on our own chain. So that's something that, um, uh, that's, you know, so those are the two things that I'm waiting for. In general, I'm, in, in, I'm incredibly receptive to new tech. So we don't hem and haw. We, we just move fast. And if there is something cool out there, I am ready to go grab it. And I'm ready to go and adopt it. And um, uh, so Wasm, for me, the risks don't outweigh the benefits yet. Uh, the community isn't big enough yet. There is nothing unique there yet. Uh, when that changes, you will hear me change my tune immediately. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm unapologetic about that. And uh, we're going to go support Wasm. But at the moment, the, the tools are terrible. Wasm is not the VM I would build if I wanted to do Wasm-like things. It's just, just a mess. Um, by the way, EVM is not the VM I would build. Just about every micro decision in, in the EVM is also bad. So um, it was designed, it wasn't designed well in my opinion. But, um, but at least the EVM has a, has a strong ecosystem that, that uh, we can tap into, that we did tap into. What are the plans for incentivizing nodes for validating other subnets? That uh, depends on the subnets. They, everybody who launches a subnet should think long and hard about how to incentivize nodes to come in, onto their subnets. Uh, the one thing that I'm doing is asking the user community to pay attention to decentralization of subnets. You should demand more validators and subnet designers, we, we direct them to thinking about all sorts of incentives, token incentives for getting people to cross validate uh, and join their subnet. So this is going to be a big thing. I'm going to be pushing on this behind the scenes as I have been. And uh, that I want there to be strong incentives for people to build permissionless subnets. Permissionless subnets are coming very, very soon. That's also on the roadmap, by the way. I'm not in Antarctica, but I would love some swag to run a node from Brazil. Uh, Luis, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I can't send swag to everybody. It's just a nightmare. But uh, since, since you said something funny, um, DM me somehow uh, or, or email me and, um, uh, and, and we'll talk. So um, uh, let's see, ETA on cross, no, no ETAs. I can't give ETAs, I, I will get killed. Um, uh, good material to learn about good VM design. Yes, the Java, Java virtual machine book is a good place to start. And the, the write-ups around Ivy, the precursor to the Java virtual machine, because that's when we first started in the research community thinking about building safe extensibility technologies. And this is this is all about safe extensions. So every smart contract is an extension to the underlying chain, so to speak. So um, 
So that's, uh, that's, that's where I would start. Go back to the 90s. Um, if you want a starting point, the SPIN operating system um, paper that appeared at SOSP, Symposium on Operating System Principles, in 1995, I think, um, that has a references section that, that cites all of the, the known efforts to that date on building safe extens extensibility technologies. So take a look. Uh, the IV discussions are very interesting. The Modular 3 uh, book by the late Greg Nelson is a, is a gem. And the very last chapter, um, Lambda Man, with uh, Lambda Man and his friends, is, is, a, is absolutely a gem. It's really, really interesting. It's all about how to design a virtual machine, a language, and a runtime that is, uh, is safe to use for writing correct code. And so those are all very important things. Uh, not that many people know about these things because not that many people have a systems background. Uh, a lot of people have a crypto background. They, they do number tricks. And the name of the game in blockchains is not number tricks. It's all systems. So, uh, so those are good starting points. I will never be able to catch up to you guys. I wanted to finish this. Let's do this. What do you think the minimum number of validators per subnet should be? Infinity. Um, so, um, you know, I want as much decentralization as, as uh, no, obviously that's, that's tongue in cheek. Infinity would, would not converge. Um, so, oh, the minimum number. Um, the minimum number should be something uh, really, really high. Number of independent validators um, should be probably in the 30 to 100, somewhere in there would be my minimum number. So uh, it depends on what I'm doing. You know, if I've got, if I'm playing a game, I don't mind having five validators. It's just a game. You know, I don't have much at stake. But if I have finance, finances at stake, depending on how much that is, um, I will I will hold it to a higher standard. If I have a thousand dollars, I want that to have at least 30 different entities that are independent from each other backing that thing. If I kingdom only had 10 validators, exactly. If it's if you're playing a game, I think you can get by with small numbers. Um, any new deals on Avalanche? I don't know what that means. Yes, there are a lot of business deals uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, people who are building on top of us and us where the business deal is something like we provide them expertise and we help them uh, launch something. We help them with developing some component of what they're building. So, so if that's what you're asking, yes. Um, top three projects for me on the Avalanche ecosystem. No, this is like who, who, which of your kids do you like the most? You know, I'm sure you heard this uh, asked to your parents or in front of you. It's a terrible question. You don't want to know the answer. So uh, if I answer this question, I will get all sorts of sad smileys in my DMs tonight. So no, I can't, I can't say that. Um, Am I looking to reduce the stake to AVAX for validators? Yes, I, I, am, I am looking to maximize the, the, the price per AVAX and minimize the, the stake to AVAX for validators. That's, those are my two hopes as I go to sleep at night. Um, so uh, uh, when are we releasing the core wallet mobile app? Soon, this got asked earlier. Um, do I use any dApps? Yes, I use a bunch of dApps and I can't tell you my favorites. Um, can you specify post-grad degree or school for distribu distributed systems to a CS student? Yes, um, there are some incredibly good uh, schools in, uh, that specialize in distributed systems. Uh, off the top of my head would be um, Cornell, MIT, Cornell, MIT, University of Washington, Berkeley, Stanford, um, and uh, then uh, uh, Technion, of course, uh, then uh, uh, I would start going around the globe a little bit. There are some fantastic schools in uh, Brown, of course. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's, I, I'm, I'm undoubted, oh, depending on the type of distributed systems, um, uh, Georgia Tech, um, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, uh, and um, uh, UC San Diego, of course. I don't know how I forgot those guys. Uh, so on and so on. I'm, again, I'm going to get sad smiley pictures from my friends for not mentioning their school. There's a whole bunch of schools. There's, there's a uh, U.S. News and World Report does a ranking. It's not the world's best, but it's worth a look. And that ranking tends to have um, a, a semi-decent list of schools. And uh, when head of Europe, I'm not sure. Um, 
So uh, yeah, I don't know if Europe will last until the spring, but uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, uh, so a few weeks ago, I said there was a big announcement I can't wait to reveal. Yes, and I have to keep my mouth shut because I've been told uh, that um, the announcement isn't coming out until uh, after Labor Day because none of you guys are around. I've been told that you guys don't exist. Everybody's off on vacation and uh, people pay attention to the space after Labor Day. So we've decided to delay it a little bit. Um, so uh, so we're going to... So here I, I sit with a huge announcement uh, that I think is really cool and I want to talk to you all about it and I can't until uh, whenever it is, not next week, but the week after, but maybe, maybe not even then, depending on world events and so on. So we'll have an announcement. We built something really cool and um, uh, nobody has anything like it. And uh, I think you guys will like it. And um, uh, even if you don't, I think you'll find it intellectually intriguing. And um, uh, I think the TradFi folks will love it. So uh, it's cool stuff. So uh, yeah, I can't wait. Um, all right. Oh, um, good schools. Uh, IITs in India, of course. And uh, there are some really great schools around Europe um, as well. Okay. So I'm going to stop here. I'm tired. I bet you are too. Um, I'm glad we did this. This was much more fun for me. It's better than me just ranting alone. Um, and uh, we'll have one of these conversations again. Uh, I'll try to make it shorter next time. And uh, take care for now. Have a great weekend. And uh, can't wait to, uh, to, to get back with you again and uh, have, a, have a two-way discussion. Take care.